ladies and gentlemen, Sanjay Poonen. For the Jazz Mafia from Oakland, California. Good to be with you all. Welcome to Late Night with Jimmy Fallon. I meant early, early morning with Sanjay Poonin. And to our set, it's the first time we're doing a live band. And jazz and blues is my favorite. You know, I'd prefer a career in music, playing with Eric Clapton in that band than software. But, you know, life has a different way. Uh, of things, and I'm delighted to have you all here. Wasn't yesterday's keynote just awesome off the charts? I mean, Pat and Ray, you just guys, not, I thought it was the best ever keynote. Uh, and I'm not kissing up to the two of you. you. If you know Pat, you can't kiss up to him because if you do, you'll get an action item list at 4.30 in the morning, that's 10 long, and you'll be having nails for breakfast with him. But, Pat, it was delightful, and I was so inspired by your tattoo that I decided to kind of <laughs> one-up you. I, uh, I fell asleep in batter-ass tattoo parlor, and I thought one wasn't enough. So I was going to one-up with I love VMware 20 years. Can you see that? What do you guys think? But thank you to all of you for being here. Uh, it's a delight to have you folks at our conference, 25,000 of you here, 100,000 watching. Uh, thank you to all of the VMware employees who helped put this together, Robin Matlock, Linda Britt, uh, Claire. Can I have you guys stand up and just acknowledge those of you who were involved? Thank you for being involved, Linda. These ladies worked so hard to make this a great show and everybody on their teams. It's delightful to have you all here. Uh, I know that we're going to have a fantastic time. The title of my talk is Pioneers of the Possible. And we're going to go through, over the course of the next 90 minutes or so, uh, a conversation with customers, give you a little bit of perspective of why some of these folks are pioneers. And then we're going to talk about somebody who's been a pioneer in the world. Uh, but I thought to start off with a story. I love stories. And I was born in a family with four boys. And my parents, I grew up in India, were immensely creative in naming their four boys. The eldest was named Sanjay, that's me. The next was named Santosh, Sandeep. So if you can get the drift here, it's S-A-N, S-A-N, S-A-N. And the final one, my parents got even more creative and called him Sunil, S-U-N. So you can imagine my mother going like, Santor, Sandeep, Sunil, no, I meant Sanjay, you. And it was always that confusion. And then I come to the United States uh, as an immigrant at age 18, and people see my name. And most Americans hadn't seen many Sanjays before, so they call me Sanjay. I mean, of course, it sort of sounds like V-San, right? So Sanjay. So for all of you V-San lovers. Then I come to California, four years later, work at Apple, and my Latino friends see my name, and it sort of sounds like San Jose. So I get called San Hey. OK? Then I meet some Norwegian friends later on in my life, Nordics. The J is a Y. So I get called San Ye. Maurizio, my Italian friend, calls me Sanjay. So the point of the matter is, whatever you call me, I respond. But there's certain things that are core to my DNA that, that people know me know that whatever you call me, there's something that's core to me. Maybe I like music more than software. Maybe I want my tombstone to not be whether I was smart or stupid that I had a big heart. It's the same with VMware. When you think about the engines that fuel us, you could call us the VM company, the virtualization company, server virtualization. We seek to be now called the digital foundation company. Sometimes our competitors are not so kind to us. They call us V other things. That's OK. There's something that's core to this company that really stands out. They're sort of the engines that fuel VMware. It's sort of like a plane with two engines. Innovation and customer obsession. 
Innovation is what allows the engine to go faster, further, and constantly look at ways in which you can actually make the better and better. Customer obsession allows you to do it in concert with customers. And my message to all of you here is that we want to do both of those together with you. Imagine if 500,000 customers could see the benefit of vSphere, vSAN, NSX, all of our Cloud Foundation being your products. We've been very fortunate and blessed to innovate in everything, starting with server virtualization, starting with software-defined storage in 2009. We're a little later to kind of really jump on the hyperconverged infrastructure, but the first things that we innovated in storage were way back in 2009. When we acquired NICIRA and began the early works in software-defined networking in 2012, when we put together desktop virtualization, mobile, and identity the first time to form the digital workspace, and as you heard in the last uh, few days, the vision of a multi-cloud, a hybrid cloud, and a virtual cloud networking. This is an amazing vision. You couple that innovation with an obsession on customer obsession, an, an NPS. Every engineer and sales rep and everybody in between is compensated on NPS. If something is not going well, you can send me an email. I know you can send Pat an email. You can send the good emails to me and the bad emails to scott.betos at vmware.com. No, I'm kidding. We want all of you to feel like you're plugged into us. And we're very fortunate. This is your vote on NPS. We've been very blessed to have the highest NPS, and that is our focus. But innovation done with customers. I shared this chart last year, and it's sort of our Sesame Street simple chart. I tell our sales reps, this is probably the one chart that gets used the most by our sales organization. If you can't describe our story in one chart, you have 100 PowerPoints, you probably have no power and very little point. The fact of the matter is that the data center is sort of like a human body. You've got your heart that's compute, you've got the storage, maybe your lungs, you've got the nervous system that's networking, and you've got the brains that's management. And what we're trying to do is help you make that journey to the cloud. That's the bottom part of the story. We call it the cloud foundation. The top part, and it's all serving apps, the top part of that story is the digital workspace. So very simply put, and that's the desktop moving edge and mobile. The digital workspace meets the cloud foundation. The combination is the digital foundation company. That's what VMware does. And we've begun this revolution with a focus on impact. Not just making an impression, making an impact. And there's three Cs that all of us collectively have had an impact on. Cost, very clearly, I'm going to walk you through some of that complexity, and carbon. And the carbon data was just fascinating to see some of that yesterday uh, from Pat. vSphere started off this revolution. When we started this off 20 years ago, these were stories. I just picked up some of the material. People would send us electricity bills of what it looked like before and after vSphere with a dramatic reduction in cost uh, off the tune of 80 plus percent. People would show us 10, sometimes 20 times uh, value creation from server consolidation uh, ratios. I think if the story goes right, Intel initially sort of fought VMware, didn't want to have it happen. Dell was one of the first investors. Pat and Michael, do I have that story right? Good. It's always a job, you know, fulfilling to agree with my boss and my chairman as opposed to disagree with them. Um, so that's how it got started. And through the, over the years, this has been an incredible story. This is kind of the revenue that you've helped us with over the 20 years of our existence. Last year was about $8 billion. Collectively, over that year, $50 billion. But I pulled up one of the ROI charts that somebody wrote in 2006. It might have been my esteemed colleague, Raghu Raghuram, that showed that every dollar spent on VMware resulted in 9 to $26 worth of economic value. This was in 2006. So I just said, let's say it's about 10x of economic value um, to you. And I think over the years, it may have been bigger. But let's say conservatively, it's 10. That 50 billion has resulted in half a trillion worth of value to you. Uh, if you were willing to be more generous than 20, it's 1 trillion worth of value uh, over the years. Our second core product, that was the heart. This is one of my favorite products. How can you not like a product that has part of your name in it, vSAN? Incredible. But the ROI here is incredible, too. It's mostly coming from CapEx and OpEx reduction, but mostly CapEx. Initially, there was a little bit of tension between us and the hardware storage players. Now I think every hardware storage player begins their presentation with hyperconverged infrastructure as the pathway to the private cloud. Dramatic reduction. We would like this 15,000 customers of vSAN. We want every one of the 500,000 customers, if you're going to invest in the private cloud, to begin your journey 
with, with uh, a hyperconverged infrastructure vSAN. And sometimes we don't always get this right. This store product is actually sort of the story of the, of the movie Sea Biscuit, where we sort of came from behind. And VMware sometimes does well. We've come from behind, and now we're number one in this category. Incredible ROI. NSX, a little not so obvious, because there's a fair amount spent on hardware, and the chart sort of looks like this. Mostly, and this is on the left-hand side, a OPEX mostly driven by a little bit of server virtualization and a network-driven architecture. What we're doing is not coming here saying you need to rip out your existing hardware, whether it's Cisco, Juniper, or Arista. You get more value out of that, or more value potentially out of your Palo Alto or load balancing capabilities. But what we're saying is you can extend the life, optimize your underlay, and invest more in your overlay. And we're going to start doing more in software all the way from the L4, the L7 stack, uh, firewalling, uh, application controllers, uh, and make that in networking stack application aware. And we can dramatically help you reduce that. At the core of that is an investment in hypercourage infrastructure. We find often investments like vSAN could trigger um, the investments in NSX. We have ROI tools that will help you make that even more dramatic. So once you've got compute, storage, and networking, you put it together then. Uh, with a lot of other components. We're just getting started in this journey with NSX, one of our top priorities. But you put that now with the brain, okay? You got the heart, the lungs, the nervous system, and the brain, where you do three A's, sort of like those three C's. You've got automation, you've got analytics and monitoring, and of course, the part that you saw yesterday, AI, and all of the incredible capabilities that you have here. When you put that now in a place where you've got the full SDDC stack, you have a variety of deployment options. Number one is deploying in a traditional hardware-driven type of on-premise environment. Okay, and here's the cost. We, we, we accumulate over 2,500 VMs. Or you could deploy this in a private cloud with a software-defined data center with the components I've talked about. And the additional cost also for cloud bursting DR, because you're usually investing that sometimes in your own data centers. Or you have the choice of now building and redoing some of those apps for public cloud. Just, but in many cases, you're going to have to add on a cost for migration and refactoring those apps. So it is technically a little more expensive, and you factor in that cost uh, on any of the hyperscalers. We think the most economically attractive is this hybrid cloud option, like VMware Cloud. Um, and where you have, for example, all of that DR capabilities built into it. So that, in essence, folks, is the core of that story. And what I've tried to show you over the last few minutes is the economic value could be extremely compelling. We think at least 10 to 20x uh, in terms of how we can generate value. With so rather than me speak more in words, I'd like to welcome uh, my first panel. Uh, please join me in welcoming on stage our, our guests from Brinks, from Sky, and from National Commercial Bank of Jamaica. Gentlemen, join me on stage. Rohan, thank you. I'll see you, Sanjay. Thank you. Hey, hey Sanjay. Nice. Ramon. Well, gentlemen, we've got a Indian American, we've got a Kiwi who now lives in the UK, and we've got a Jamaican. Maybe we should talk about cricket, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which, by the way, is a very exciting sport. It lasts only five days, but nonetheless. Um, Ro I want to start with you, uh, Rohan. You um, Brinks is an incredible story. Um, everyone knows the armored trucks and security. Have you driven in one of those? Yes. You have. It's a great <laughs> story. And the stock price has doubled. Uh, you're a CIO that brings business and IT together. Maybe we can start there. How have you effectively been able to do that in bridging business and IT? Thank you, Sanjay. So let me start by describing who is the business, right? Who is Brinks? So Brinks is the number one secure logistics and cash management services company in the world. Our job is to protect our customers' most precious assets, their cash, precious metals, diamonds, jewelry, commodities, and so on. You've seen our trucks in your neighborhoods, in your cities, even in countries across the world, right? But the world is going digital. And so we have to ratchet up our use of digital technologies and tools in order to continue to serve our customers in a digital world. So we're building a digital network that extends all the way out to the edges. And our edges are branches, our, our messengers and their handheld devices, our trucks, and even our computer control safes 
that we place on our customers' premises, all the way back to our monitoring centers, our processing centers, and our data centers, so that we can receive events that are taking place in that cache ecosystem around our customers and react and be proactive in our service of them. And at the heart of this digital business transformation is the VMware product suite. We have been able to use the products to successfully architect a hybrid cloud data center in North America at Brinks. Awesome. Uh, Ramon, I'd, I'd like to get to you next, but before I do that, you made a tremendous sacrifice to be here because you just had a two-month-old baby. <laughs> How is your sleep? <laughs> Getting there. I've been there with <laughs> twins, and we have a nice little gift for you. Oh, uh, for you here. Why don't you open it and show everybody what's inside that? Um, something I think your two month old will like once you get to the bottom of all that paper. <laughs> Whoa. I'm, I, I'm sure something's in there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, geez. All right, there we go. That's one. Now, that's the better one. Open it up. There's a VMware little outfit for your two month old. All right, guys. This is great. Thank you. <laughs> right, thank a you. VMware onesie. Great. Well, we appreciate you being here and making the sacrifice um, in the midst of that. But I was amazed listening to you. I mean, we think of Jamaica, it's a you know, vacation spot, it's also an incredible place with athletes and Usain Bolt. But when I, you are not just the biggest bank in Jamaica, but also one of the innovators in picking areas like containers and so on. How did you build an innovation culture in the bank? Well, I think to add to what Rohat said, the world is going digital. And NCB, we have an aspiration to become the Caribbean's first digital bank. And what that meant for us is two things. One is to reinvent our core business processes and two, to ensure that our customers, when they interact with the bank across all channels, have a, what we call the Amazon experience. And to drive that, what we actually had to do was to work in two modes. Uh, the first mode, we call mode one, is to keep the lights on, keep the bank running. And mode two, which is standing up a whole set of agile labs to ensure that we could innovate and transform and grow our business. And the heart of that was on the PKS platform. So. It, <laughs> yeah, man. PKS rocks. You guys should try it. <laughs> We're going to talk more about that. I'm sure that won't be the last we hear from Chad. Right. But uh, that's great. Hey, now I'd like to get a little deeper into the products with all of you folks and just understand how you've engineered that, that transformation, maybe in sort of the order we covered in my earlier comments and speech. Rowan, you basically began the journey with the private cloud optimization going with, of course, vSphere vSAN in a VxRail environment to optimize your private cloud. And then, of course, we'll get to the public cloud later. But how did that work out for you? And why did you pick vSAN? And how has it gone? So, Sanjay, we started down this journey in the fourth quarter of 2016. And if you remember, back then, the VMC product was not yet a product. But we still had the vision, even back then, of bridging from a private data center into a public cloud. So we started with vSAN because it helped us tackle an important component of our data center stack, right? And we could get on a common platform, common set of processes and tools, so that when we were ready for the full stack, VMC would be there, and it was, and then we could extend past that. Awesome. And, and I gotta say, Dave, with a name like Dave Matthews, <laughs> you, you must have like all these musicians like well, me exactly, yeah. think you're <laughs> yeah, the real my, Dave my Matthews. Band's back, you know? <laughs> what, what's your favorite Dave Matthews song? Well, it has to be Crash to me, right? Crash, you know, yeah, good choice, right? Crash. <laughs> um, but we'll get to music another time. Mm -hmm. what, NSX was obviously a big transformational uh, capability for Absolutely. you, and everyone knows with Sky and media and wireless and all of that stuff, networking is at the core of what you do. Why did you pick NSX, and what have you been able to achieve with it? So, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, it's like you say, Sky is yeah, a media organization. It's an incredibly fast-moving industry. It's very innovative. We've got a lot of really clever people in-house. In, in, in and we, we need to make sure our product guys and our developers can move at pace. And, yeah, we've got, some great, we've got really good quality network guys. They're great guys. But the problem is that traditional networking is just fundamentally slow. There's, there's, there's not much you can do about it. You know, you know, you know, and you know, to these agile teams, you know, punch a ticket, you know, get a firewall change, yeah, that's just not reality. We're able to turn that around so that the, the, the DevOps and developers, they can just use Terraform and do everything. You know, it's you know, week, weeks or days to, to seconds. 
And that's incredible. That, days to seconds. Days to seconds. With an agile, software-driven approach. And giving the tool set. much longer because it would have been hardware-driven. Absolutely. And giving the tool set to the developers so they can basically just do, do you know, within boundaries, you know, sensible boundaries, they can do it all themselves. So you empower the developers in a very, very, you know, important way with NSX. Yeah. And you had, did you use our inside tools too on top of that? So yes, yeah, so our network inside? slightly different use case. I mean, we're, yeah, we're in the EU, you've got uh, the general data protection regulations come through and that's, that's, that's a big deal. And, uh, and the reality is for modern organizations, compliance isn't getting any, compliance isn't getting any, any less, right? So what we've done, been able to do is using VRNI and NSX, we're able to, uh, to essentially micro-segment off a lot of our, uh, our, our environments, which have much higher compliance re requirements. And you've got, in your case, you know, plenty of storage that you're managing with vSAN, tens of thousands of VMs through NSX. This is something at scale that both of you have been able to achieve with both NSX and vSAN. Pretty incredible. And what I also like about the Sky story is it's very centered around DevOps and the DevOps use case. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, come to you, Ramon. And, and obviously, I was when I was talking to the Kubernetes, uh, you know, our Kubernetes platform team, PKS, and they told me one of the pioneering customers was National Commercial Bank of Jamaica. I was like, wow, that's awesome. Let's bring you in. And when we heard your story, it, it's incredible. Why did you pick Kubernetes as the container platform? You had many choices of what you could have done in terms of Kubernetes. There are other choices. Why did you pick PKS? So I think, well, what happened to, in our interviews cases, we first looked at PCF, right, which we thought was a very good platform as well. But we looked at the integration that you can get with PKS, the security, the overlay of NXX, and it made sense for us to go in that direction because it offered the development team more flexibility and more automation that we could drive through to drive the business. So that was the core essence of the argument that we had to make. So The key part was the NSX integration. And security. And in, in the PKS. Mm -hmm. uh, and well, we got a few more cheers from the heckler there. Um, <laughs> all right, Chad. I want you to know, Chad, I've got my PKS socks on, okay? <laughs> uh, that's, how much I, that's how much I fear. And if he creates too much trouble with security, we can V-motion him out of the arena. <laughs> uh, you know. Anyway, um, I wanted to put this chart up because it's very important for all of you um, in the audience to know that VMware is making a significant commitment to Kubernetes. Uh, we feel that this is, as Pat talked about before, something that's going to be integrated into everything we do. It's going to become like a dial tone. Um, and this is just the first of many things you're going to see uh, VMware really take this now as a consistent thing. And I think we have an opportunity collectively, because uh, a lot of people think, oh, you know, containers are a threat to VMware. We actually think it's a headwind that's going to become a tailwind for us, just the same way public cloud has been. So thank you for being one of our pioneering early customers. Sure. And are you using uh, the Kubernetes platform in the context of running in a vSphere environment on VMware? Yes, we are. We are on top of NSXT right now. Uh, we have our first application will be a remote banking app, which will be launched in September. And all our agile labs are going to be on PPKS moving forward. Got it. So it's, it's really a good move for us. Dave, I know that you've not yet, I mean, you're looking in the context potentially, but is your, one of the use cases of NSX for you containers, and how do you view NSXT in that context? Absolutely. For us, I mean, that was a big thing about T when it first rocked up, is that the, um, you know, not just, you know, SDN on, uh, on vSphere, but SDN on OpenStack, SDN into that container platform. And we got some early visibility of the, uh, of the, the, the Kubernetes integration there. And, you know, it was, it was done right from the start. And that's why when we talked to the PKS guys, again, the same sort of thing, you know, it's, 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 it's done right from the start. And so, yeah, certainly for us, the, the NSX everywhere uh, as that common control plane uh, is a very attractive sort of uh, proposition. Good. Um, Ron, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about kind of how you viewed the public cloud. Because you mentioned when we started off this journey, we didn't have VMware Cloud and AWS. We approached you when we were very early on in that journey. And you took a bet with us. Uh, but it was part of your data center reduction. You were yeah. kind of trying, almost trying to obliterate one data center as you went from two to one. Tell us that story and yeah. how the collaboration worked out uh, on VMware Cloud. What's the use case? So as I said, our vision was always to bridge to a public cloud, right? So we wanted to be able to use public cloud environments you know, to incubate new applications until they stabilize, to flex to the cloud, and ultimately, disaster recovery in the cloud. That was the big use case for us. We ran a traditional data center environment where you know, we run across four regions in the world. Each region had two to three data centers. One was the primary, and then usually you had a disaster recovery center. 
where you had all of your data hosted, you had a certain amount of compute, but it was essentially a cold center, right? It, uh, it sat idle, you did your test once a year. That's the environment we were really looking to get out of. Once VMC was available, we were able to create the same VMware environment that we currently have on-prem in the cloud, right? The same network and security stack in both places. And we were actually able to then decommission our disaster recovery Just data center. took it off. Just took it off, and we moved, we've got our our, all of our mission critical data now in the, uh, in the uh, AWS instance using VMC. We have a small amount of compute to keep it warm, but thanks to the VMware product suite, we have the ability now to ratchet that up very quickly in a DR situation, run production in the cloud until we stabilize and then bring that workload back. Right? And so Ron, would it be fair to tell everybody here, if you are looking at a DR or that type of bursting scenario, there's no reason to invest in a on-premise private cloud that's really a perfect use case of this, right? Exactly. For anybody. Yeah, exactly. It. Yeah, we, I, I know certainly uh, we at Brinks, uh, we will no longer have a, uh, a physical DR uh, center available anywhere. So you've optimized your one data center with the private cloud stack of VMware Cloud Foundation effectively, yep. starting off at vSAN. Yep. And you've optimized your hybrid cloud journey uh, with VMware Cloud. I know we're early on in the journey with NSX and Branch, so we'll come yeah. back to that conversation maybe next year. We, yep. I discovered new things about this guy. I just found <laughs> out last night that he grew up in the same town as me in Bangalore and went to the same school. So we will keep uh, down rival the journey of discovery. Rival schools. All right, rival schools. But the last two years was the same school. <laughs> uh, Dave, as you think about the future of where you want to take this um, mm -hmm. you know, use case of network security, what are some of the things that are on your radar over the course of the next couple of months and quarters? So I think what we're really trying to do is, um, you know, computers, look, this might be a heretical thing to say at a technology conference. Computers and networks are a bit boring. You know, or rather, we want to make them boring. We want to basically sweep them away from, so that our, people, our customers, our internal customers, don't have to think about it. With it and that we can bake in that, that compliance, that security, that whole, that whole framework around it. Um, regardless of where, where that work I live, is living, on-premise, off-premise, everywhere, you know, and, and even actually potentially out, out to the edge. How big were your teams, very quickly as we wrap up this, how big were the teams that you have working on networking? What was amazing when I talked to you was how nimble and agile you were with lean teams. How big was your team? The, the team doing the, uh, the STTC stack is uh, six people. Six? Six people. Wow. There's obviously more. The, more and uh, working, of course, yeah, but working on that core data center. And yours? Yeah, we're about the same between five and seven people per team, per agile team. Both for the infrastructure and containers? Yes. Rowan, on your side? It's about the same. same. Amazing. Well, very quickly, maybe 30 seconds, where do you see the world going, Rowan? So, you know, it brings, I pay attention to two things. One is IoT, and we've talked a little bit about that. But what I'm looking for there, as digital signals continue to grow, is injecting things like machine learning and artificial intelligence in line into that flow back so we can make more decisions closer to the source, right? And the second thing is about cash. So even though cash volume is increasing, I mean, here we are in Vegas, the number one cash city in, in the US, I can't ignore the digital payments and cryptocurrency, and that relies on blockchain. So focusing on what role does blockchain play in the global world as we go forward, and how can Brinks continue to bring those services. Blockchain and IoT, very, very important. Well, gentlemen, thank you for being with us. It's a, a pleasure and an honor. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for our three guests. Rowan, thank you very much. Thank you. Dave, thank, thank you. Come on, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, so as you saw there, it's, it's great to be able to see and learn from some of these pioneering customers and the, hopefully the lesson you took away was wherever your journey is, you could start potentially with the private cloud, embark on the journey to the public cloud, and then now comes the next part, which is pretty exciting, which is the journey of the desktop removal, what digital workspace. And that's the second part of this that I want to explore with a couple of customers. But before I do that, I want to set the context of why what we're trying to do here also has economic value. Hopefully you saw in the first uh, set of charts the economic value of starting with the heart, the lungs, any of that software-defined data center and moving to the ultimate hybrid cloud had economic value. We feel the same thing here. And it's because of a fundamental shift that started off in the last seven, 10 years since the iPhone. The fact of the matter is when you look at your fleet of your devices, okay, across tablets, phones, and laptops, today it is a heterogeneous world. 20 years ago, when the company started, it was probably all Microsoft devices, laptops. 
Now, phones, tablets, it's a mixture, and it was, it's going to be a mixture for the rest of, I think, of the foreseeable time, with very strong, almost trillion market cap companies. And in this world, our job is to ensure that heterogeneous digital workspace can be very easily managed and secured. I have a little soft corner for this business because the first three years of my five years here, I ran this business, so I know a thing about these products. But the, the, the fact of the matter is that I think the opportunity here is, if you think about the seven billion people in the world, a billion of them are working for some company or the other. The others are children or may not be employed or, or retired. And every one of them have a phone today. Many of them phones and laptops, and they're mixed. And our job is to ensure that we bring simplicity to this place. You saw a little bit of that cacophony yesterday in Pat's chart. And unfortunately, a lot of today's world of managing and securing that disparate is a mountain of morass. Okay? No offense to any of the vendors named in there, but it shouldn't be your job to be that white piece of labor at the top of the mountain to put it all together, which costs you potentially at least $50 per user per month. We can make this significantly cheaper with a unified platform, Workspace ONE, that has all of those elements. So how have we done that? We've taken those fundamental principles, 70% at least reduction, of simplicity and security. A lot of the you know, um, enterprise companies get security right, but we don't get simplicity all, always right. Many of the consumer companies like Facebook get simplicity right, but maybe need some help in security. And we've taken both of those and said it is possible for you to actually like your user experience as opposed to having to really dread your user experience uh, in being able to get access to applications. And how we did this at VMware, we, we actually teamed with the Stanford Design School. We put many of our product managers through this concept of design thinking. It's a really, really useful concept. I'd encourage every one of you, I'm not making a plug for the Stanford Design School at all, but some very basic principles of viability, desirability, and feasibility that allow your product folks to think like a consumer. And that's the key goal. And in doing that, we were able to design many of these products with the type of simplicity, but not compromise at all in security. Tremendous opportunity ahead of us, and it gives me great pleasure uh, to bring on stage now two uh, guests that are doing some pioneering work, one from a partner and one from a customer. Please join me in welcoming Maria Pardé from DXC and John Market from Adobe. Thank you, Maria. Have a seat. Hi, John. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Maria and John, for being with us. Um, Maria, I want to start with you. Um, DXC um, is the coming together of two companies, and CSC and HP Services. And on the, service, on the surface of it, I think it was 50,000 and 100,000. You can give us exact numbers. Most skeptics may have said such a big acquisition is probably going to fail. But you're looking now at the end of that sort of post-merger, and, and most people would say it's been a success. What's made the DXC coming together of those two very different cultures a success? Well, well first of all, you have to uh, credit a lot of uh, very creative people in the space uh, when the two companies came together. But mostly, it is our customers who are making us successful. We are choosing to take our customers to the next generation digital platform. The message is resonating. The cultures have come together. The individuals have come together. The offers have come together. And it's resonating in the marketplace, in the market, and with our customers and with our partners. So you shouldn't have doubted it. Uh, <laughs> I, I wasn't one of the skeptics. Maybe <laughs> others were. And my understanding is the D and the C in DXC is the digital and customer? Yes. If, if you look at the logo, it's, it's more of an infinity X. Okay, got it. So digital transformation for customers. But truthfully, it's, um, we wanted to have a new start to some very powerful companies in the industry. And it really was, uh, instead of CSC and HP, a new logo and a new start. And I think you know, it resonates very well with what I started off my keynote, which is talking about innovation and customers, focus on digital and customers. John, Adobe is obviously not just a household name. Uh, many of folks here use your products, but also you folks have written the playbook on a transformation of on-premise going cloud, right? Uh, SaaS products and now got an incredible valuation as well. That 
How has that affected the way you think in IT in terms of a cloud-first type of philosophy uh, to much of how you implement? Right, from an IT perspective, we're really focused on the employee experience. And so as we transitioned our products to the cloud, that's where we're working towards as well from an IT. It's all about innovation and fostering that ability for employees to create and do some amazing products. So many of those things I talked about, like design thinking, are right down the playbook right what Adobe does Absolutely. day in, day out. every day. And does it affect the way in which you build, pro sorry, deploy products in IT too? Yeah, I mean, it, it fundamentally, it comes down to those basics, uh, viability and the employee experience. And we strongly believe that by giving employees choice, we're enabling them to do amazing work. Got it. Maria, you, obviously, have, you, you, we're in the process of rolling out some of our technology inside DXC, so I want to focus less, less on the internal implementation as much as what you see from other clients. I shared sort of that mountain of morass, so much different disparate tools. Is that what you hear from clients, and how are you uh, messaging to them what you think the future of the digital workspace is in our joint partnership? Yep. Well, Sanjay, your picture was perfect, because if you look at the way end-user compute infrastructure had worked for years, decades in the past, exactly what we're doing with VMware in terms of automation and driving that infrastructure to the cloud in many ways. Um, companies like yours and mine having the courage to say the old way of on-prem is the way we made our license fees, the way we made our professional services in the past, and now we have to quickly take our customers to a new way of working, a fast-paced digital cloud transformation we see it in every customer that we're dealing with every day of the week. And in a variety of verticals? What are every, some of the key verticals? Every vertical. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're seeing um, a lot in the healthcare industry. Um, one of the compelling things that we're seeing in the marketplace right now is the next-gen worker in terms of the gig economy. Um, employees might work for one company at 10 o'clock in the morning and another company at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We have to be able to stand those um, employees or 1099 employees up very quickly, contract workers from around the world, and do it securely um, with governance, risk, and compliance quickly. Uh, and we see that driving a lot of the next generation infrastructure needs. So the users are going from a company like DXC with 160,000 employees to what we think in the future will be another 200, 300,000 of, um, of partners and contract workers that we still have to treat with the same security, sensitivity, and governance of our W-2 employees. Awesome. John, you were one of the pioneering customers that we worked with on this notion of unified endpoint management because you're sort of a similar employee based to VMware. 20,000 odd employees? 20,000 plus, yeah. Um, and you've got a mixture of devices in your fleet. Maybe you can give us a little bit of a sense. What percentage do you have of Windows and Mac? So depending on the geographies, we're approximately 50% Windows. 50, 50, Windows 50, and 50, Mac. Yeah. It's somewhat similar to how VMware operates. What does your fleet of mobile phones look like in terms of Apple? Primarily iOS. We have so maybe 80-20 or something 80, 20, like yeah. uh, Apple and iOS. Yep. Tablets of variety kinds? It's, it's primarily iOS tablets. Okay, so you probably have something in the order of, I'm guessing, adding that up. 40 or 50,000 devices, some total of laptops, tablets, phones. Absolutely, it's about 60,000. 60,000 60, plus, okay, in a mixture of those. So heterogeneity is the care. Um, and you had point tools for many of those in terms of managing and securing that. Why did you decide to go with Workspace ONE to simplify that, that management security experience? Well, you, you nailed it. It's, it's all about simplification. And so we, we wanted to take our point tools and provide a consistent experience from an IT perspective, how we manage those endpoints, but also for our employee population, to, for them to be able to have a consistent experience across all of their devices. In the past, it was very disconnected. It was, if you had an iOS device, the experience might look like this. If you had a Windows, it would look like this. And so our journey that we've started to go down about a year ago is to bring that together. Again, simplicity. We want to get to a place where uh, an employee can self-provision their desktop, just like they do their, their mobile device today. And um, what would, what's your expectations as you go down that journey of how quickly the onboarding time should, should be for an employee? It should be within 15, 20 minutes. 15, we need, to, 20 we minutes. need to get it very rapid. Um, the, the new hire orientation process needs to really be modified. It's no longer acceptable from everything from the IT side to the, just the other recruiting aspects. An employee wants to come and start immediately. They want to be productive. They want to make 
uh, contributions. And so what we want to do from an IT perspective is get IT out of the way and enable employees to be productive as quickly as possible. And the onboarding then could be one where you latch them on, they get Workspace One and launch. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Um, yeah, Maria, let's talk a little bit as we wrap up in the next few minutes. Or where do you see the world going in terms of other areas that are synergistic to Workspace One, collaboration, um, you know, what are some of the things that you hear from clients? What's the future of collaboration? Um, we're actually looking towards a future where we're less dependent on email. So, I'd say yes to so that. So real, real time collaboration. DXC is doing a lot with Skype for Business, uh, Yammer, still a lot with Citrix. Um, our tech teams and our development teams use Slack. Uh, and our clients are using everything. So as an integrator to this space, we see less dependence on the um, asynchronous world and a lot more dependence on the bisynchronous world and whatever tools that you can have to create real-time um, collaboration. Now, you and I spoke a little last night talking about what does that mean to life-work balance when there's always uh, demanding real-time collaboration, but we're seeing an uptick in that, and hopefully over the next few years, a slight downtick in, in emails, because that is not necessarily the most direct way to communicate all the time. And, and in that process, some of that sort of legacy environment starts to get replaced with newer tools, whether it's Slack or Zoom, or, and we're in a similar all, experience. All, all, all of, of the them. above, yeah. all of the above. Um, are you finding the same thing, John, Absolutely. in your environment? Yeah, we're moving away. There, there's. I think what you're going to see transition is email becomes more of the reporting aspect, the notification, but the day-to-day -day collaboration is made of products like Slack or Teams. Yeah. Uh, at Adobe, we're very video focused, and so even though we may be a very global team around the world, we will typically communicate over some form of video, whether it be BlueJeans or Jabber or whatnot. So you've got BlueJeans for your collaboration. Yeah, we've internally used WebEx and, and um um, and, and Zoom and, and also a lot of Slack, and we're happy to announce, I think at the work, breakouts we'll hear about the integration of Workspace ONE with Slack. We're doing a lot with them. Maria, I want to end with a final question with you. Obviously, you're very passionate about a cause that we uh, also love and are passionate about, and we're going to hear more about from Malala, which is more women in technology, diversity uh, and inclusion, and you know, especially in the areas of STEM. And you are obviously a role model in doing that. What would you say to some of the women here uh, and others who might be mentors to women in technology of how they can shape their career? Um, I think probably the women here are already rocking it and doing what you need to do. So, <laughs> mentoring has been a huge part of uh, my career in terms of people mentoring me. And if not for uh, the support and um, real acceptance of, of the differences that I brought to the workplace, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be sitting here today. So I think I might have more advice for the men sitting Good. in this I like room that. Go ahead. Than, <laughs> than the women yes. in the room. Um, you're all, you have daughters, you have sisters, you have mothers, and you have women that you work every day. Um, whether you know it or not, there is an unconscious bias yep. out there. So when you hear things from your sons or even from your daughters, she's loud, she's a little odd, she's unique. How about saying, how wonderful is that? Let's celebrate yes. that. And you start from the little and go to the top. So that would, be, that would be my advice. I fully endorse that. I fully endorse that. All of us men need to hear that. We have put everyone at VMware through unconscious bias. And it's not enough. We've got to keep doing it because it's something that we've got to see. I want my daughter to be in a place where the tech world looks like society, which is not 25, 30% women, but more like 50%. Thank you for being a role model, and thank you for both of you for being here at our conference. It's my panel. pleasure. Thank you, Maria. Thank, thank you. you. Give it up for Maria and John. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Great. OK, so you heard you heard um, some of that, and so that you remember some of these things that I shared with you, I've got a couple of shirts here with these wonderful little chart in here, and I'm not going to throw it at the VMware crowd. Raise your hand if you're a customer. OK, good. Let's see how good my arm is. There we go. There's a couple more here. And hopefully, this will give you a sense 
uh, of what we are trying to get done in the hybrid cloud. Let's see, that goes there. Make sure it doesn't hit anybody. Anybody here in the middle? All right, there we go, boom. I got two more. Anybody here? I decided not to bring an air gun in. That one fell flat, sorry. All right, there we go, one more. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. But this is what we're trying to get done, very simply, folks. The bottom part of that diagram, once again, is the cloud foundation, okay? I'd love a world one day where the only thing you heard from VMware is the cloud foundation. The top part of that diagram is the digital workspace. The digital workspace meets the cloud foundation equals the digital foundation company. That's what we're trying to get done. This ties absolutely uh, synchronously what you heard from Pat, because everything starts with that any app uh, kind of perspective of things. And then below it are these four types of clouds, the hybrid cloud, the telco cloud, the edge cloud, and the public cloud. And of course, on top of it is a device. I hope that this not just inspired you in terms of picking up a few of the nuggets from our pioneers of the possible, but every one of the 25,000 of you possible, the 100,000 of you who are watching this, will take the show on the road, and there'll be probably 100,000 people who will meet at all the VMworlds and VForums. We want every one of you to be a pioneer. It is absolutely possible for that to happen because that pioneering uh, capability starts with every one of you. Can we give a hand once again for the five customers that were on stage with us? That's great.